Hi everyone, it's day 59 of the Vendée Globe and my guest today is Sir Robin Knox Johnson, a sailing legend who became a household name when in April 1969 he became the first person to circumnavigate the globe non-stop, single-handed, as the winner of the Golden Globe. Sir Robin founded the Clipper Race in 1995 to give ordinary people the chance to do something extraordinary. The Clipper Race is a biennial round the world race for amateur crews led by professional skippers on each team. And Robin is no stranger to the Amoka class, having yet again circumnavigated the globe, but this time in the Velux Five Oceans race, where he sailed the former Italian sailor Giovanni Soldini's Open 60 feeler. Welcome, Robin. Good evening, Codred. It's fantastic. Now, I, I can imagine, uh, like all sailors at the moment, you've been glued to the, the Vendée Globe tracker. What's your impression of the race so far? Do you know, the most impressive thing, I think, Conrad, is how many of the boats have got round Cape Horn without trouble. Yep. I mean, normally we expect half the boats to have pulled out by this time in the race. We've only had six out of 33. And they're all piling round Cape Horn at the moment. I mean, there's, what, 14 of them got round now. Um, they're still OK. They're still going strongly. And I think that's interesting because it shows that we're beginning to get these boats right and the guys are beginning to get the sailing them right. But uh, what it's led to, and of course you're on to that, is the excitement now. They're round Cape Horn and what they're faced with because... The South Atlantic is an absolute mess at the moment. <laughs> I mean, how does anyone, I mean, you and I have looked at it together. I mean, just look at the weather. You say, what linking choice do I take with this lot? Because everything's moving around. It is. I mean, for the leaders, it's an impossible situation, really. I mean, he's done so well so far, frankly. And, yeah. um He's made all the calls right. He's made all the calls right, and uh, and you know you wouldn't bet against him getting you know, th this this tactical nightmare right. But um, but of course he's got you know ten other boats breathing down his neck who who have different options to hit to him, and it looks like at the moment he's going to have to just sort of almost sit and wait for his routes and watch his lead erode away, which will be horrendous. Oh, I mean, imagine sitting on his boat and watching that happen. You know how it hurts us. We <laughs> hate that. But he's sitting there saying, I've got this lead. It's a pretty good lead. But how do I work my way through this absolute maze, which is yeah. in front? Of and it is a maze. I mean, you look at it and you say, what has happened to the South Atlantic? It's utterly confusing at the moment. Yeah, yeah, And quite honestly, Conrad, I can say to you, I'm very glad I'm not in this race because it is going to be so easy to make just one slight decision wrong and you've lost it totally. Yeah, no, Because quite honestly, that weather is so confusing at the moment. Now, I just want to take you back to 1969, I assume you passed the horn in, in 69 rather than 68, although I might be wrong. What was it like going round it for your first time? Well, Conrad, it, it's very embarrassing, really, because I actually got about seven miles south of the horn, flat becalmed. And, of course, everyone expects you to be in big storms when you get there, but I was absolutely flat becalmed. And... I remember sitting there with the tide, you know, we know the current's quite strong there, slowly pushing me around and looking at the hills of Tierra del Fuego and the great dark clouds there and thinking, oh my God, they're going to hit me sooner or later. And you're sitting there saying, just let me get clear of this. Just let me get clear of this. I just want to get round. I've been in the Southern Ocean for five months <laughs> and... I was tired, you know, it, it knocks the hell out of you, the Southern Ocean. And I was tired. I'd, you know, got injuries as a result. Um, I just wanted to get round the horn and get back into the South Atlantic, as, of course, all these guys do. Yeah. 
once they're around the horn and they suddenly lose that huge swell which you've seen which keeps rolling on and rolling on and then the depressions come in on top of it and you get waves of what 27 30 meters you know you're just so glad to get round the horn and just get round to the south atlantic but right now for these chaps in, in this race getting round the horn okay great relief but now they've got this incredible problem dealing with what i call a totally bizarre situation in the south atlantic and you've looked at it what do you think well i i think it's a it's a maze and and you know whilst they're talking about two or three weeks back to the south de Lon, you know my take on this is we could see them you know spend a, a week extra trying to get out of the south atlantic um so yeah very very complicated so what was it was it 69 that you you actually went round the horn or was it 68 it was 17th of january 69 17th of january and, so almost um, the same time yeah it was yeah and um, of course i had no idea where my competition was well, um, that was my next question actually was uh, at that stage did you have any idea where you were in the fleet at all I knew off New Zealand I got the lead. I was four weeks ahead of Matessio. And what we discovered later on was I, I rounded the horn on the 17th of January. He rounded on the 9th of February. Okay. But neither of us knew that at the time because no. we didn't have the communications. There were no satellites in those days. Yeah. There was no weather information. You know, you, you, you worked on what your barometer told you what the wind's doing and what the clouds are doing. That's all we had to work on. So I went round the horn with no idea where Matissia was. Um, and it wasn't until three months later, I discovered he'd been that far behind me. Uh, but we didn't know that at the time. Now you went round again in 2007, Velux Five Oceans race. Uh, were the conditions any different at that time? Yes, they were. I had much stronger winds, and because I'd lost all my communications, my total, my sat nav had broken down. I had to go up to a shire to get it sorted out, so I had to turn inside Cape Horn and go up the Beagle Channel to find some specialists who could sort out my communications. Um, I lost a bit of time doing that, probably about four or five days. But um, I'll tell you something. Turning into the Beagle Channel when it's blowing a bloody hooli from the west and you're being pushed onto the Argentine coast is a nightmare I do not want to do again. Uh, I can, I've, I've, I've heard some horror stories of people doing that, uh, that, that trip. Um, and of course, you know, if we look back in history, you know, so many people came a cropper trying to find that route. You know, I mean, I think originally they thought this was, you know, even before Cape Horn was discovered, you know, they, that was the, the end of the world as far as they were concerned. Um, right. So, um, so I've got a, a short video clip here of, uh, of Clarice and Armel going round the horn. And of course, they went round for, the, for their very first time. J'ai encore un peu de mal à réaliser, puis je suis pas tout à fait sortie d'affaires, mais c'est cool, c'est cool, c'est la teuf, je suis contente. Qu'est-ce qu'il en faut de l'énergie pour, euh, pour faire tout ça Je suis vraiment contente. Bon voilà, derrière moi là, là, il y a un petit bout de terre avec un phare, ça s'appelle le Cap Horn. C'est incroyable, c'est hallucinant, putain, le voir aussi frais comme ça, waouh Quelle émotion, c'est magnifique On est arrivé là, c'est splendide. Grand, grand, grand moment. Incredible moments for, for, for those two. Um, they really you know, sort of capture it there. So, uh, should we have a quick look at the, uh, at the, the weather um, and see if we can make sense of, of what's going on? <laughs> Let me uh, let me just bring up the the, the 
current situation. Uh, so there we there we've got Yannick, who's now punched through the other side of this high pressure system. Yeah. Um, Thomas and Charlie uh, have gone to the upwind side of it, or you know the uh, the, the, the left hand side, and then you've got the rest of the fleet still trying to get around the the downwind side of it. Um, it, it looks like Yannick is going to get uh, a few days of, of freedom and probably extend. But then, as you say, there's a number of little systems, two little low pressures coming off the continent uh, and this huge, great ridge that he seems to, to, to try and get ahead, get, get ahead of. So if I go to that's on Wednesday, if I go to Friday, I mean, it's just a bloody mess, isn't it? <laughs> Quite quite honestly, Conrad, you look at this mess, and it is a mess, you're quite right. Just say, what the hell do you do? Um, I just hope they've got really good information, because there are little opportunities, but then they lead to total dumps. Yep. And, you know, you, you say, well, um, Besseman can sort of shoot himself through, slingshot himself through, but... What's he going into? Another bloody calm area. Yeah. The whole South Atlantic is a total mess. The normal situation where, you know, what we all expect is a big high in the middle, go left of it, the winds are on your nose, go right of it, they're behind you. It's not happening like that. Yeah. There's a total mess up there. And I suppose I would turn around and say, actually, I'm quite happy sitting in my kitchen not having to do that problem. Yeah, yeah. And of course, for, for people like um, Armel Trippon, um, and looking further back, even you've got uh, Jeremy Bayou on Chiral, you've got Pip Hare. Yeah. You know, they're piling into the horn. They'll be there in a few days' time. I mean, this it would be the, the, the most amazing comeback. Imagine if uh, if, if Jeremy Bayou on Chiral actually manages <laughs> to get in, in amongst this lot. <laughs> after starting what you know 10 days later well i i think jeremy bayou has done surprisingly well actually considering uh the disadvantages he had at the start but he's sort of quietly made himself you know quietly moved up the fleet and he's got a very fast boat um you know once they're around the horn um that whole situation is changing isn't it yeah um you you think you've got the right choice and the weather, but you might not. You might get totally stuck. I can remember sitting just after rounding it, and um, I was lying on deck because it was quite warm. And for 20 minutes, I didn't hear anything. There wasn't a sound. There wasn't a sound of slapping on the hull or anything. It was so totally calm. And that went on for two or three days. And these guys are going to have the same thing. Mm -hmm. Okay, they've got more efficient boats. They can make more of the wind, what little there is. Yeah. But the fact of the matter is, there's going to be some very calm periods there for all of them. Yeah. And they're going to have to try and work out which way to go. Go, win on the nose. You know, when we did it with Enza, um, it was quite interesting because Curses on closed up on us. And he went close into the shore, and we went outside. Yeah. And our teams panicked, you know, said, oh, he's overtaking it. We said, relax, we'll get the right wind in the end. Yeah. Which we did. But it was by going to the east, we picked up the right wind. Well, uh, it's interesting but, you say but, that. But, but, Conrad, look at the weather now. That isn't the right decision. Yeah, it's interesting you say that because so I, I run a, a route uh, and it and it favours going up the coast um, uh, and I'll show you that in a second. But I was actually looking at this thinking, well, assuming things go back to normal at some stage, where would you want to be in, in that eventuality? You'd want to be east. Traditionally, you know, you'd want to get that easting in. Um but uh, if we have a quick look at the the routing, which is here, I mean, 
you know, this is Expedition's attempt at trying to find a, a way through all this. Um, and what it tends to do is is, is to look inshore um, and to, to work work its way up the, the, the Brazilian coast. Um, but in all honesty, you know, I, I don't know where you'd want to be on this course, because if I stop it there, you know, you've got a thousand miles of nothing. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, yeah, very, very, very difficult. So I'd like to just briefly touch on Pip Hare, because I'm sure you know, you know Pip. Um, yeah. She's sailing a 20 year old Amoka, you know, the same generation of boats that you and I both sail yep uh here she is in 15th place she's you know a few days away from the horn um doing a remarkable job eh? i i think pipe is doing bloody well actually considering she's got an old boat and uh on the other hand it's probably a solid boat a good safe boat which i hope it is um but i think she's been holding her place rather well i think the interesting thing is conrad what people have to realize is there isn't a huge database of information about the South Atlantic. Yeah. Brazilians and the Argentines do not supply NOAA with enough information. And the result is we have a situation where we cannot use the normal uh, programs we use mm -hmm. to try and work out what the weather's going to do. Yeah. So, you know, you and I know very well, the French forecasters are extremely good. Yeah. You know, if you're racing across the Atlantic in the north, you rely on the French because, frankly, they're the best. But down here, no one's the best. Yeah. And so all these poor sailors are, are stuck with a situation where they've got information which isn't reliable and they're going to have to sort of try and work their way through it. Yeah. And quite honestly... I'm sort of glad I'm not doing it. Yeah, well, but interestingly, that was what Will Harris was saying on Monday was, um, you know, actually you could be 20 miles apart from each other and have completely different conditions um, and not really know why one boat is going well or one boat isn't. And um, we're looking well, at weather charts and, and, it, and they may not have the same conditions. Well, that's right. I mean, when I did the Whitbread in 77, 78, uh, we were in sight of each other. It was Tavdi, myself, and Che. And we're in sight of each other. And all of a sudden, one would get a bit of wind and move. And we're crossing the equator. And I'm afraid that's the way the winds are. Yep. You know, someone got a little bit of a bit of wind and they move forward. And you're sitting there saying, why haven't I got that wind? Well, I haven't. I've got to wait for my chance to come. And this is what it's like in those highs. You know, everyone can get a little bit of wind or no wind. And they can sit there and look at everyone closing up on them. Or they can say, I've just got that little bit of drift, that three or four knots of wind that enables me to move. And I'm going to grab it. But they're all going to have to go through this. So they're all coming around the horn, very relieved. My God, they'll be relieved. And I think it's amazing how many of them are succeeding in doing that. Yeah. yeah. But the fact is, they're going to have to get through this bloody bizarre confusion <laughs> of the system in the South Atlantic. And I've never seen it this confused. I don't know about you. No. I've never seen it this confused. No, I've never, I've never seen it like this. I mean, in fact, in 2004, this was my fastest part of the race. Um, yeah. I, I actually posted some of my best runs in this section of the race. Uh, came round the horn with a with a nice depression. It carried me. I got another depression off the Argentinian coast. Uh, but um, yeah, it's a it's it's a total mess. Well, Robin, that's been really insightful. Really, really great to catch up with you. Um, I know you must be busy as hell with uh, preparations to get your fleet and race back underway um, in this pesky time. Uh, you told me earlier that you've had your jab, so you're good to go. You just need to make sure that all your skippers <laughs> and crews are all vaccinated and get back to normality, hopefully, this summer. Let's hope so, uh, Conrad. You know, I, I think about the, all those skippers coming back into La Salle and into lockdown. 
<laughs> you know, you just think you're far better off at sea. You, you are. I mean, uh, yeah. I, I, I think during 2004 race, there was things like Mad Cow. There was the tsunami that happened in on Boxing Day. Um, right. You know, my my wife continually said to me, you know, you you really don't want to be coming back to this. And can you imagine their situation. You know, coming back to to the UK at the moment. You know, they have to stay on their boat for two weeks <laughs> quarantine. <laughs> But can you imagine coming back into the sub and saying, you're in quarantine, chum? <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> so that was uh, Sir Robin Knox Johnson. Absolutely fascinating to catch up with him and uh, and just get his insights. He's clearly loving the race. Um, not not loving the complexity of the South Atlantic as, as if anyone <laughs> would want to be there at this stage. Uh, but absolutely brilliant we're back on friday uh with a with a very lovely little guest a young sailor uh who, who who's been following the race and has got lots of questions so we'll see you then thanks a lot bye bye